Hello and welcome to the King Heroes Journey podcast. My name is Beth Martins. So glad to have you here while we're waiting for a few people to jump in. I do see that uh, Sue Finelli is here and Mark Bloom is here. That's awesome. Good to see you guys. And let's see if I can... For a few people. Oh, almost caught that. <laughs> So uh, I'm super happy to be here with Chance Garton. Did I say your name correctly, by the way? That's how I usually say it. Although Excellent. Garton sounds kind of cool too. Garton. Excellent. <laughs> Garton. I will say I noticed on the banner that it's interverse.com, but actually it's interversepodcast.com. But, oh, uh, totally ruined no it. Oh, I meant to ask you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to change that. So we'll, we'll, uh, I'll take a second now to do that while people are still logging on. And uh, I can't tell it. you how many names I've misspelled. There are things like oh, that I've boy. done and then published it. So it's uh, part of the podcast host's life. There's many more details than you would think before you get into it. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and you know that just like guessing is always going to lead you down a garden path. So this is the second time I've spelled something wrong. Hopefully we don't go for third. Interversepodcast.com is where you can find Mr. Chance, and uh, I definitely recommend to go over there, and there's some pretty interesting stuff. I am newer to his work, but it looks like we have a whole lot of things in common, and uh, I think that's probably why you reached out to me in the first place, so that's that's awesome. And uh, you might see me on, on uh, Chance's podcast over at Interverse as well, so that's good. He's nodding. Excellent. <laughs> Hello to Droid132, uh, Andrew Creel. Maybe I'll just call you Droid. Greetings and peace to you. Flat Earth Ship Bear is here. Thor at the door. Mr. Steve is here. Can you guys hear me Always all right? Always good to today? have Thor. Always good to have a Thor. <laughs> exactly. This is a very special one that we've got here. Yes. And uh, so just let me know if you guys can hear me okay. I, my guests can hear me and I hear me. So um, I think we're doing better. Somehow the sound is good, and I have my uh, my cat Ocean here, who tends all of the podcasts religiously live. You might see him crawl up my head and <laughs> try to get my attention. Hello to Yvette, nice to see you, and you can hear me. Excellent. All right, so let's dive in. This uh, King Heroes Journey podcast is to highlight those often men, not exclusively by any means, but uh, that are out there speaking the truth in a way that many people may know and see it but aren't brave enough to put their voice out and to stand by all of those things that uh, some people or many people know and it's a risk you know I was outside uh, or not outside but I was out and about today and I went into my what was my favorite bakery but they're they're all uh, I don't know how to say this kindly but uh, you know pretty socialist over there and uh you know she's got a she's got a she's got her mask on and she's got a piece of plexiglass and there's nobody in the bakery and uh i let my thing slip down so i could breathe and she's like right on me like but pull that mask up and i said you know well i'm not going to spit on you this way right you got a mask and you got the plexiglass and my spit isn't going to make it over to you and she's like i don't want to talk about it and well you, you talked about it you told me to put my thing on and you know i just for a while I was leaving people alone and now I think I'm done again leaving people alone. <laughs> we got to talk about it for a while. But anyway, let's get to the, the subject at hand here. Um, those that are willing to speak the truth, not only just to, to say it in a grocery store, but to get on a podcast and speak the truth and say those things that you've discovered. Obviously, uh, Chance, you have gone very deep in the rabbit hole, not just with uncovering lies, but going even deeper into the psyche, into the uh, archetypal level, the symbolic level. And uh, when I heard you speak, I just knew that it was uh, it was definitely going to be a good chance for us to get on this uh, channel and have a conversation together so other people could hear it as well. And if you're not familiar with my work, I am an archetype and business coach. I host the King Heroes Journey podcast, as you can tell. And uh, I also have a number of ways to work with people. I train coaches in, in coaching with archetypes and deep programming tools. I'm right now hosting the Primal Power course, which is amazing. A bunch of like really beautiful souls 
are in that course. And uh, we're working through the archetypes that are really specifically weaponized us, uh, against us at this point. I'm going to be speaking about it at Anarchapulco coming up on, on the main stage at... Uh, no, I won't. I won't be in Mexico. I think I'm not going to make it uh, on a plane and through all of that nonsense that it takes to travel these days. But I will be there virtually. And uh, hi, nice to meet you too, Billington Bear. <laughs> so if I'm introduced, my people are are knowing who I am, obviously. So, Chance, would you like to take a few minutes and introduce yourself? I know you have an interesting story how you came to all of this in the first place. Do you want to share that with us as well? <laughs> Oh, you know, the more you tell your own story, the less interesting it kind of feels. But in a lot of ways, I'm like the type of 31 year old male that you would have expected everything about their life journey growing up in the Midwest. You could have predicted being raised in, you know, Christian household, being taken to church, going to uh, high school with a bunch of other people scattered across the low to high middle class income range and you know, uh, for a lot of people, just that very description of my background means that you could dismiss me as being too privileged for their opinion to matter, which is interesting. I mean, I don't say I'm not privileged. I am someone lucky to have parents that are loving and helpful, right? So that puts you in a certain level of material security in life that, in my opinion, become, gives you like a responsibility to build something valuable off of that scaffolding just as much as if you had a hard life that you needed to do something to elevate. It doesn't matter where you came from, we're here to rise. And for me, I got really stuck uh, in my early 20s, going through the motions of going to college, got myself kicked out of journalism school, always kind of had some problems with authority, even when I didn't really even understand the concept of authority uh, in, on a spiritual level. But uh, what helped me because we're, we're going to be talking about archetypes. What really helped me in my backstory that I never would have expected was that as an English major and a film studies minor, which is not about the making of films, but it's about the visual language of films. So visual language and how that plays on not just visual language, but also, um, you know, the way different musical scores will also influence the emotions of the person viewing the piece of media, right? So getting into symbolic literacy from analyzing film and literature at that level. I didn't know it, but I was arming myself with the first line of psychic self-defense that you need in order to navigate the uh, illusions spun by media constantly, left and right, trying to get their hooks and you play on your emotions, traumatize you so that you're dilated and open to accept the messaging that is following up that uh, trauma, false flags, what, what have you. And so I still didn't really like, I still wasn't in my mojo at the time of getting out of college by no means. And what happened to me was getting into going to music festivals with some friends that did that and seeing a different, seeing the, what you call the counterculture, you know, there's a good and bad in that just like everywhere. But what I witnessed was people coming together to do the stuff that they love, whether it's painters, people making music, people that just like to go and be there for the live music, whatever the case by, might be, it's like a microcosm of a bigger life. It's like a little mini incarnation when you go to this, you know, out to a field somewhere on a mountain somewhere and you're camping out for three to five days and you're with the tribe that you came with, or maybe you're alone and synchronicity is just storming in those kind of places because our fields get all linked for the same intention, which mm. is have a good time, raise the vibe. And that's when I was like, oh man, magic is a real thing. <laughs> Stuff happens that you cannot explain materially. And it was as it's, it's like, I don't know, mundane as it seems, going to music festivals literally woke me up to my spiritual path because it also showed me, not just, you too, see, okay. Too. I, everybody gets it that's, that's done these, these festivals that went to the right ones. They're, they can be so life-changing because it's just like, oh, Here's humanity in celebration of our gifts. And it's crazy that we even have to like set a time and a date and all gather together and pay a ticket fee to even have those experiences because that is a symptom of the disassociation of humanity from spirit, in my opinion. Because creative creativity itself is like our link to the creator. Uh, it's our little ability to subcreate in the 
in the imaginal, the way that Tolkien calls it uh, sub-creation. Really interesting take that mm. we work with the primary elements of creation and then we sort of alchemically can do something with that and make little miniature worlds in our own world, in the, in the larger world, if you will. So I got into just like drawing with Sharpies and like learning Adobe programs for digital art and things like that. And all of a sudden this void inside me started to feel fulfilled. And it was just by getting into my creative path and then synchronicity picked up in my life outside of music festivals and those type of events. I started having conversations like this where I'm like, I, I really think creativity might be the actual true religion. <laughs> I mean, uh, in a, it's not just about that. In uh, in truth, we there's an element of purifying our vessel that is very important too, so that we can hold a greater charge. But one on the creative path will realize these things as they seek to ascend in the levels of vision that they can put a body in, put into a body, right? So you realize, like, wow, if I feel constantly kind of low key tired or agitated, my paintings are worse or whatever the the task is so these paths intertwine intertwine with each other and having these kind of conversations start to appear in my life after i started building up my personal energy was what made me want to get into doing podcasts and oh my gosh that was the real life changer because hmm. the i don't know the rhetoric that i had going into that stuff compared to now it's just like i'm a totally different guy i've learned so much and how to discern the ring of truth as what you titled this episode is one of the most important things. And actually, although there is intu intuition of truth before that, it wasn't really till like last year that it clicked that the answer to that was that you just got to define the truth. But I'm going to pass it back over to you and we can pick up on that. It's really exciting to me that you also are a bestie person. <laughs> uh, pardon me, a what person? Uh, a festy person. Music. A festy person. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I grew up at, uh, I grew myself up at music festivals. And I did, I did have very similar revelations in that there was, uh, you know, it, it was, it was a beautiful demonstration of how people could get along with minimal to no supervision. Actually, we camped this year and because of COVID, all of the um, park rangers weren't allowed to interact with us and it went so good without them, right? Like people just made their way. We just lived and there was the odd thing that needed to be dealt with and you just talked to somebody and it was done and it like, you know, life can be like that and i like what you say about the celebration and i also like very much what you say about how you know it it is this artificial situation also that you, you paid your ticket and it's this once a year thing and i would always like this is great but why don't we live like this and it's not all just like going from stage to stage and enjoying uh, your friends, obviously there's there's work and there's labor involved, but that becomes part of the festival culture in, in uh, the, the, I love the word convivial, right? Where the life is supportive mutually and, and you're working together on the, on the life project. And uh, yeah, I, I, I have a lot of faith that humans can, can do that. Um, and I, can I mm -hmm. respond to something in the Please. chat real quick? This is, yes. a, I think, an important point, too. Mm -hmm. Someone said, yo, these people are lost. Maybe they're talking about festy going people. And I think that there's the same amount of lost people that go to music festivals as there are lost people that go to work at the mall tomorrow. It's <laughs> There is a lot of abuse of substances in that realm. There's also people that start out with... Um, a recreational reason to use a substance, have some sort of huge pineal aperture opening experience and go, oh, I can't act like that. And so it's up to the individual what they make of that culture. And there's festivals that are just an excuse for a bunch of teenagers to get into a field and do drugs together. And then there's festivals that are about yoga, about healing arts workshops and that the music is literally just one component of this overall huge constellation. And even in those that have positive intentions that are built to be what they call transformational festivals, maybe some of those teachers aren't the best, have, don't have all the best ideas, just like any other place. But I don't think we should rule out that gathering humanity in mass for the intention of bringing our gifts together and sharing our creative light is in any way a lost cause. <laughs> I just want to address that. 
Yeah, amen. That's really good. Uh, Juan just said a lot more open-minded people at a festival than a mall Ten, tends to be. Although I was, uh, no, my kid was at the mall. It's funny how I was going to say I was. I, I wasn't there. <laughs> just that word, it. the mall. You go I get know. mauled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then it's uh, it's lovely what you said about, you know, being these sub creators, because if you, you might be at one festival, but you're actually if there's, you know, 500 people or 2000 people there, you're, you're actually ha you actually have 500 or 2000 worlds going on, right? They're creating their own world within a world. And so you can't necessarily say it's any any exactly one thing. Of course, the creator of that festival is determining some of the the quality of people that are going to be there through their branding, through their messaging, what they what they stand for. But, um, you know, we so, yo, watch out for corporate festivals, because some of the big acts that even get around to festivals that otherwise are pretty on the light side, there's some extreme frequency warfare that goes on. This is a whole nother topic. I've talked about it on some other shows a while back, but I get why people want to like knock on that whole culture and crowd, because just like any anything in the so-called counterculture of music, CIA is right there uh, coming up to someone who's popular, like, hey, we'll help you really make it on the headliner list. Just, you know, let's experiment with some mind control frequencies. Like there's this dude last year when Pluto was in retrograde, all kinds of artists in the music festival industry. And of course, everywhere we saw happen in Hollywood and such, but so many just started getting outed of like, oh, this guy's a sexual predator. Oh, this guy does this shady thing. Oh, Bass Nectar, one of the biggest musical acts in the country for years. I saw them in, in Mexico. He, he got busted for being a predator. And then I found a book from 1965 or something that was about how to basically it was like a how to manual for mind control i can't remember the title of the book off the top of my head but the symbol that was on the cover of this book this weird sigil was 95 percent match the exact same as base nectar sigil or his Whoa. logo whatever Whoa. and i was like and i've heard people like mark devlin go into how there's anecdotal stories of that guy being involved with suits um you know uh, intelligence agency type suits so mm -hmm. I, people use their discernment i i just think that the you go into a place like that with discernment and you see that there's a guy called space jesus on stage right now and he's blasting with like gray alien symbols and ufos and devil devil everything like you know maybe walk away from that set <laughs> maybe don't take in that vibe i get it yeah. Uh, yeah. but there's maybe a, a stage somewhere else where some up and coming really creative and spiritually aligned a young guy or maybe someone who's been doing it for a long time has got music that's going to transport you into a, a, a wider aperture for that moment and you're going to get into your flow state and dance and enjoy it and don't mm -hmm. judge the people that went to space jesus because <laughs> you know like that's even the low here's the thing hires and lowers is a tricky thing when it comes to there is such a thing as you know manipulative frequency usage coming from screens coming from everything that is true but uh, as far as low frequencies go as a concept, there's this like new age thing that we need to be raising our vibrations and just be high vibrational. And that's akin to just pure head in the clouds, not grounded in your mm. body, dualism yeah. between mind and spirit or body and spirit or body and mind. And we're really wholeness is requiring every part of the spectrum. It's just uh, Eileen Day McCusick. I don't know if you've heard of her. One of my favorite authors, uh, she's a, she started biofieldtuning.com and she started off as a tuning fork practitioner. Awesome energy work uh, person to learn from. She just put out a new book that I've cracked into today, Electric Body, Electric Health. Ooh, and nice. She has a great line in there about how we really should reframe language around frequency. And instead of putting it into the higher lowers thing, let's go with coherent and dissonant. Mm, nice. So, yeah, like the space Jesus frequencies might be really dissonant, not coherent. You can tell what this is the ring of truth. Mm. Music, for example, you can tell if there's coherence or dissonance in it. If you really if you really like feel if you have your body feeling aperture open. But yeah, mm -hmm. and you can I love I love this conversation. It's so good. And you can take um, 
the the dissonance that you called it like not coherence and you can turn it into coherence so i personally that's been my claim to fame that i studied with for example a guru in india and it turned out he was a pedophile and maybe even a murderer right so lots of really bad stuff going on behind the scenes in uh you know just won't even go into detail about that but uh but I actually made good on my education. I didn't know that was going on. I was luckily not accepted into the inner circle, even though I wanted to be. <laughs> God spared me. And I just did my work in the background and took what I, you know, considered to be some nuggets of, of truth. And there were probably 80% truth and 20% not, which is often how these things go. And, uh, and I got the benefit of, of it. It was of huge value to my life, but I, I still, of course, saw the source of it and didn't stay with the source once we knew what was going on there. But, uh, you know, also, I think I, I had a number of demonic attacks and, and I turned it into an archetype journey and had breakthroughs and healings through it. But I, but I saw in retrospect that it was likely demonic attacks. Yeah, I've uh, been aperture open at some, to go back to festivals for one more thing. I've actually in a place where I could see more of the spectrum, if you will, um, been able to perceive entity interaction at big crowds when one of these mm. like sound sorcerers, black magic guys is on the stage. Uh, and I think that some of the larger, I, I can name a few, but I, I, we don't need to worry about that. But I think some of the larger production companies are tied in with the same networks that get people famous in Hollywood and they get them famous on the uh, underground music festival circuit instead. And it's all these, you know, how these compartmentalized organizations work favors for favors. If you have something over somebody, you insert this into your set and we'll make sure that you're on the stage or whatever. There's always deals like that going on. But when we understand the energy of our attention, we should really think about whether or not as a group, we want to send so much of our spiritual currency of our witness, as James True calls it, right at one directed point because you know power corrupts absolute power corrupts absolutely and it's part of what i call the disassociation of the entire concept of you know having one person that's on the stage that everybody is like that's the one that's the king of the sound because if we just had lifestyles where we were in some kind of more village situation where you know it's a festival every day you know all your neighbors and Maybe there's stages around the place where we live and whoever wants to get up on the stage where they can be amplified and witnessed can do it. And we just take our turns and take our time. And there doesn't need to be one who's the special one. The ones that put the time and energy into crafting their skill, honing their skill and become really apt at their, their musical game. If we're continuing that example, then they might draw more witness and that's, it would be more of a natural thing. And I just think, that we got to stop putting this is another James true quote, but nobody, <laughs> neither side benefits from a pedestal relationship. One of the most important things I've learned in my life recently, especially in your one to one relationships with people, but also within anyone you're looking at as a teacher, because maybe the guy that you've let be your guru, um, someone on the internet is not a rapist or a murderer, but they're still probably in the 80 20 range true to incorrect you know that's like we're all here to refine that it's uh the only way to come to truth is to rule out all the things you can no longer accept as truth because the truth is the ring of truth is a circle and it contains everything it's truth is the totality of reality <laughs> so uh we got to just figure out what's not part of that we can't really say what that is other than it's everything truth is the only thing that exists Mm -hmm, in an mm -hmm. interesting way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it comes down to that that discernment that uh, when you look at somebody or you, um, you know, because I could I could say just read this guy's books and um, I could hear him speak and I could and I've got several people in mind at the same time here, and uh, and I can pull out you know I can I can look at Osho stuff and I can pull out something that's useful for my day. But knowing what I know about, um, actually, it's not a super good example with Osho because I don't, I don't, uh, you know, I haven't really done the rabbit hole with him. The ins and outs, was he demonized because he was a good one or whatever, who knows, right? Yeah, and, everyone uh, has a bird on him somewhere. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's like shooting fish in a barrel. Um, you know, with my guru in India, the, the moment I learned that he was a pedophile, the moment I, I severed ties like that, that was clearly right. And, and uh, when, when you see somebody isn't acting in integrity, or they're not honest, or they can't own something that is actually um, the truth, something that they said, and they and they'll, they'll gaslight and deny, and then get on their podcast and slam you uh, with without any provocation whatsoever. Need to take you down and your work and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, okay, then you know, many people have seen uh, this happen, and then they continue to follow that person. And they continue to, um, you know, go, oh, well, you know, yeah, you might be an asshole that way, but we'll just pull out the truth from whatever. And, and it's the same thing uh, with the with the music that personally, I stopped listening to the vast majority of any kind of mainstream music because of what's going on in the background. I know the source. I know how those people get into that uh, level of fame and production. And then why am I going to fill my body with that frequency? Uh, I like what you said also about that, you know, and in fact, that's how I almost died of a stage four lymphoma was by by always trying to be in the high frequencies and uh, and suppressing the hell out of the, the low ones. Because, you know, and, and it, this it tells the, the body that you're ready to leave. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> it sends that message. Like, right. You don't need me. Okay, let you go. Right, right. Well, that's an interesting way to look at it. And, uh, you know, neither is it to glorify the shadow, because that's not, uh, you know, that's how we get the, the psychopathic leaders of the world and people following them and, and, uh, you know, the dark magic, all that kind of thing, glorifying the dark. It's not about that we are here. And, and you've said it already, we are here to purify and become the superconductors that we actually can be in potential. And, uh, and so, you know, it's it, it, very interesting to see frequency, you know, when, when you raise it, are you raising it because you've genuinely gone down and, and recaptured yourself from the, the uh, I don't know, language is going to fall through here for me now, but, uh, you know, uncovering a shadow is how I would talk about it, seeing, putting the light of day on it, um, bringing consciousness to what was unconscious, and ca and getting back the energy you were using to suppress that, that dark stuff, and then rising, right? It's a different, it's a different kind of rising, it's rising into wisdom rather than rising into denial and, uh, and further suppression. So it's still raising energy, you know, some people say oh, without the dark, we can't see the light, but I don't, I don't really think that's actually um, the truth of it, personally. But if you use that light to deny and suppress the dark, then then you're, you're not doomed, but you're going to have to go through that dark, it's not going to leave you alone. Yeah, it should be like the bones or the foundation, but not the, let's look at it this way. I mean, the language is where we all try to talk about the same thing, but we have different language and it gets us all babbled out. <laughs> but, uh, right, raising vibrations, I do like coherence, as Eileen says, or uh, just upping your voltage or your charge, uh, mm -hmm. higher energy level doesn't necessarily have the same connotation as, as like higher and lower um, vibration seems to taken on, which is just like sort of a you know, spiritual jargon at this point or new age jargon, but magnets. Okay. This is the greatest way to think about it. What happens if you take a magnet and you break it in half? Now the magnet has a positive and negative on each half. It used to be one piece that had a positive pole and a negative pole, but now it's two pieces, each with a positive and negative pole. So uh, if you look at that in terms of your own energy system, your mind and your body or your spirit and your body, you break that in half and now you've got uh, a dualistic mind and a dualistic spirit or a and dualistic body in a sense you've created those poles in each thing and also because that lower half that you're the shadow that you're trying to repress and the repression of the shadow content of your consciousness or your subconscious whatever is the uh, that's the breaking of your magnet into half in a sense is the, re the repression is where you break it in half or you arbitrate the line and it's really <laughs> impossible to even put two magnets back together in nature so this is a herculean task once we've 
suffer this type of internal division to actually repair that repair <laughs> that that word explains it but uh, the set the lower half to continue with the metaphor the one of the sides that was the negative half before it got split and now it's got its own positive and negative that means it's got some of your light split off from you some of your positive is in that thing because it's holding a positive half now too if you follow the metaphor but electricity and magnetism can really help us when we start looking at okay to go to archetypes this might be a good pivot point when we start looking at archetypes they could either be archons which are rulers or controllers or they can be uh guardian angels and your relationship to these archons is everything to do with your relationship to different parts of your body which is widely unknown but there's a system of correspondences. Maybe people have different ways of interpreting the system of correspondences. Maybe it's even slightly different for different people. Like maybe the right is the left for some people. Who knows? It's about, you got to do your own spiritual science on these things. But the part of your body that is the broken off part of the magnet, say where you're storing the trauma energy, that could correspond to say Venus, depending on where you're talking about. And so then the archetype of Venus in your life can start coming in as the corrupted archon a relationship that goes awry or a controlling mother it can happen in a bunch of different ways in your external but it's one energy that your aperture is dividing into a bunch of different mental perceptions and physical sense perceptions and when we, when we can start to unify the mental and the sense perceptions with what happens in the external by recognizing that whatever it is, is just a particular flavor that is explaining your discharge. And discharge can mean many things. It can mean like offloading energy, which is what we do when we victimize ourselves in any way. It's actually a clever strategy to dump excess energy that we're afraid to hold and be responsible for. And then discharge could be like what you call a negative charge, dis as in bad or harmful. So, uh, Charge and discharge is a natural part of what we do as electric beings. But we need to recognize when we've discharged because it gives us this feeling where we can be tired and wired at the same time. And it's a very strange feeling because it's a discharge. You have a charge, but it's bad. It's dissonant. It's not coherent. And when you're in a discharge, you're also dumping energy because you've got some kind of hole or leak in your field where this discharge is happening, it's discharging. And that's what's gonna draw in something like a magnet that represents that spot in the field, whether it's pain in the body that corresponds to that particular part of the spectrum that we're talking about. And uh, biofield anatomy is a really helpful way of getting a handle on this. There's, uh, Eileen's books are great for that, but other teachers can help you with that too. Different systems are talking about the same thing, whether it's chakras or, you know, electricity but i think that this is what we can start to use to actually heal the un the connection to the unconscious content is by literally relinking in our awareness that okay this external person or situation is linked to this type of pain is linked to this trauma in my past let's like put that all back together and recognize that it's one thing get the charge right get the charge harmonious instead of dissonant in that place and then realize it's not over at that point because you got a groove in your record right there from when you got your teeth knocked out in a car wreck or whatever it was so just be aware that like you might need to continue building the charge in that way continue doing meditations with self fegio frequencies targeted to the solar plexus or or whatever your thing is for me it's always solar plexus but uh, has to do with i guess like human design or my my sky clock chart but this is i think the relationship to the archetypes that we need to have and not let <laughs> and what happens with the corruption of archetypes which we can go deep into uh if you want is like you see it on tv someone playing a, an archetypal role and you're a young kid for example and now you think that whenever you get into situations with you know a romantic partner or something that this is the way that that archetype is supposed to act so then when they act all crazy because that's how they saw it on tv or that's what they saw their people playing out you've got a corrupted version of that archetype in your mind and so you're bringing it to yourself reigniting the trauma of every time that that archetype ever came and 
archoned on you. <laughs> and so that's where the groove gets scratched deeper and deeper, but we can definitely heal that and re record that. Nice. And so at what point does the, and, and do you want to, do you want to back up just because uh, I, I have my way to define archetypes, but also archetypes and archons. What, how would you, how would you define those just for the discussion moving forward? Yeah, I think that I would define archetypes as those things that have those correspondences between all systems of perception or description, the way that like red is the root chakra is a uh, sort lower on the frequency bandwidth is, you know, how there's this one and is also maybe you corresponded to a planet and uh, a personality or traits, you know, like this to me, that's what the archetypes are They're uh, they a lot of times they're described just on the character logical level, the personality level, the pantheon, if you will, but it's also parts of our body. It's that there's one light, one energy of creation, which is God's existence, God's being. That's the permanent state of beingness that reality is. If you care to define reality in existence, which is a, actually a verb. And so that constant beingness of infinite light we refract that we divide that in our vessel through our aperture of our third eye and the way the brain then filters out the pure white light of source into a bunch of different perceptions that uh work together synchronistically to give us a a uh, what you call a movie <laughs> type of existence like you know if you if all your senses were giving you the information of the field around you separately from different points in your body and then routing that signal up to your brain, uh, the signal would be coming at different speeds from different parts of the body. And so the way that these things would align in timing, I think would be screwy. I think that the fact that we experience all of our senses in a synchronized flow of moment to moment uh, coordination speaks to the fact that there's actually like one sense, there's one lens, the third eye, pineal, and then that splits and filters up out of the optic thalamus area of the brain and sends those signals to different parts of the body to give, uh, to give us the variety of descriptive enjoyment of that one light from moment to moment, if that makes sense. Uh, so archetypes are that filtration system that gives us the story as well, that gives us the different colors that that's the palette we paint with in reality so having a corrupted version of archetypes through the way that our temple has suffered and is dissonant and through our expectations that are programmed into us by what we see on screens that is i think what keeps people living in a loop of repeating similar situations with similar people and uh feeling stuck on a in the chronos time as i call it which is the hamster wheel time where every day is nearly the same but nothing ever changes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's what i call fake time <laughs> human made time there you go you're getting some appreciation in the chat here thank you everybody mm -hmm. and uh so i was listening to one of your podcasts and maybe i maybe i misheard but um, do you consider god to be an archetype uh, no, I don't consider God to be archetype. Mm -hmm. I consider, like I def Clint Richardson's the greatest teacher that ever helped me get a handle on God as a concept. And uh, he did it through etymologically looking at the name of God from the old times, which is Jehovah. So th to be clear, Jehovah is not a character in at least in the etymological meaning of the word. It's not an <laughs> <laughs> I'm just glad it's not me. <laughs> the mixer has a Bluetooth thing, and so my phone uh, automatically Went off. Connect. Usually, I put it in airplane mode before I get on a show. Sorry about that. Not a problem. <laughs> no, I'm just glad it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you fix it, but <laughs> yeah. So, Jehovah as a concept is supposed to represent the being aspect of reality itself, um, the eternal state of becoming. So it's a verb, it's a process, it's what we consider nature. 
it's not an entity separate outside of the creation, but it's also not just the creation that we can perceive. It's beyond in a sense, but it's not supernatural because if it was supernatural, that would put it above itself, which seems pointless. It's the circle. The ring of truth is God. That's the circle that contains all that is. Oh, and nice. You, me you meant a, 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 this kind of ring, not the bell ring. Well, it, but yeah, but it's multiple layers in this poetic metaphor. They, they both work. Yeah, because at first I was looking for a ring image, and then I thought, oh, no, I, no, I think he means the bell ring. So I picked a bell. <laughs> it could be either. Yeah, because you feel, you feel whenever something is coherent, you feel it. It feels coherent to hear it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's life affirming. If we want to look at some, I like one thing I like about Clint Richardson's Richardson's work, and you can find his YouTube at Red Pill Sunday School. But I recommend BitChute because they already took his, they took all his vaccine documentaries off the air, which are really helpful content and super fair. Just showing like you know, legal code stuff and just this is reality. This is what's happening. Anyway, that's you know hate speech now describing reality <laughs> but he goes yeah. back to the old dictionaries all the time law dictionaries and webster's dictionary i love doing that because you get closer to the original intent spirit and etymological significance of the word so when we look at the word truth it, in the webster's 1828 the first definition is conformity to fact or reality exact accordance with that which is or has been or shall be the truth of history can constitutes its whole value. And uh, yeah, I agree with that example because the parts of history that are not true are definitely less than valuable, but there is something true probably in history. Pro Triple Seven all the time quotes the Napoleon thing that history is a set of lies agreed upon, but he just had a guest on that challenged him on that and I really loved it, who said that that's a, also like a dismissive thing to say because obviously there's some elements of history that we all accept, like that this podcast is being aired on January 27th, 2021. But uh, let's go back to this truth word, conformity to fact or reality. So then we're going to jump over to, there's more definitions for truth that are also very telling. But let's go over to reality, actual being or existence of anything. Okay, uh, let's look at existence. Existence. The first definition is the state of being or having essence as the existence of body and soul in union, the separate existence of the soul. Uh, so the next definition is life or animation is a definition for existence. So we've gone from truth and come over to existence. And one of the definitions of existence is life. I think this is what's really important to getting the ring of truth. That which is life affirming is what is coherent. And mm. that which is yep. anti-life, artificial, anti-nature, not the way nature would have done it, is not necessarily going to be life. Like, it's not necessarily going to be true. It might be factual. And factual has a whole different definition in the legal textbook than it does in the mm -hmm. uh, English language textbook. But I think this is what we need. This is what I needed as someone who was a constant truth seeker, spiritual seeker, thirsty all the time well, what is spirit it's the essence so existence spirit is ex is existence the state of being or having essence well that is what that is what jehovah or god or truth gives us is that animating force that keeps us perpetually present in this moment and allows for there to be something instead of no thingness although in terms of nouns there actually are no nouns even the old Hopi language only ever described things as a process in, in a verb way. Mm -hmm. I think that's way more useful because we get identified with nouns and that's where we get stuck and trapped. I'm this, I'm that, I'm this title, I'm this quality. And what we need to focus on is that to get out of being a truth seeker, all you got to do is define truth correctly. And if we all had the same definition of truth, we'd no longer have moral relativism or oh, <laughs> at all i mean we might have some disagreements about how to whether or not something is reflected in nature and we can hash all that out but if we got down to the basics of defining truth together as being that which actually exists we'd be in a good place i think we could work everything else out from there 
And if anybody has moral relativists in their lives or someone wants to tell them, it's my truth and your truth, but there's no the truth, then just ask them, or they say there's no such thing as absolute truth. All you got to ask them is, is that statement true? And you win. (laughs) (laughs) That can't be, that statement itself can't be true. If it was true, it's not true. Paradox. So, (laughs) uh, you know, we all have different perspectives on it too. It's a multifaceted thing. So let's not get on our high horse about any one instance in, of something that we accept is true that we couldn't actually verify for ourselves. But in the cases that we do have the zetetic ability to verify what it is that we claim is true with our senses and maybe even show it to somebody else, then, then go for it and then stand up for that truth. But don't like be ready also for the I was wrong. Those are really powerful words. <laughs> that, that should be your compass, though, that you're looking for what's life affirming and what has some sort of grounds in actual reality that is perceivable in mm-hmm. terms of the ring of truth and the coherent aspect of anything that has the ring of truth. That's the life affirming aspect. That's the bell ring. And then mm. the totality of all that exists is the circle ring if you will. Mm, Beautiful. Nice. You've tied it all together. I love that. (laughs) Yeah. So good. So good. Doing this on the fly. These are kind of new metaphors for me too. It's a lot of fun. That's awesome. Yeah. One of my pet peeves with uh, the, you know, God bless the truth movement, but there, there's a lot of people out there who are stuck on exposing lies and that, that, you know, that is by the, by the definition that you're saying, that is part of truth, like to see something that it's, it's a rope, it's not a snake, it's a rope or the other way around. Oh, it's not a rope. It's a snake after all. And uh, so it, you know, it's a, it's a place in truth, but I love what you're saying that it's actually more of a verb if we thought in terms of verb, because it is a living organic thing. So once you expose uh, the lie of something, it's your, your job is not done. You, you can keep going deeper and deeper and deeper into whether it's your expression of truth or, or seeing that which is actual and and bona fide is in existence and seeing it for what it is i i i totally don't subscribe to to only seeing through filters and only having it be relative there there is a reality and you can get down to it if you do enough of your <clears throat> excuse me own inner work to to not uh, have your filters so multi-layered that you can't see through them to me to me that's the ultimate work to to take the filters down and uh, and have reality present itself and be seen as it is. So that's all awesome stuff. Um, what about archons? Like I, I know I know my general definition of that. How would you how would you define that and how does it relate to archetypes? Okay, so an archon is a ruler, and in the human realm we have archons all over the place. I think that in um, the original spiritual writings that talk about archons they're probably talking about the actual people who put themselves up with a title to be a ruler in my opinion now the synchronistic encountering of guardian angel type people in the right time and the right place that's not an archon that's you having a positive experience with an archetype that's you being whole with that archetype it, there, you know it, there's no separation in the inner and outer it's showing up right when you need it to there's synchronicity and coherence there but the negative experience of archetypes can come through in addiction, possession, the things that I, I say possession as in like even the possession of titles or our personhood in the legal sense is a type of demonic possession because it's a separate thing, an entity, a noun, an artificial that is then is created artificially, created by ourself or other men. And so that thing then tries to be like an external ruler or an external inside of you in a weird way because like uh that that dissonant energy that's somewhere in your field that came from some childhood experience maybe that leads you to uh, want to cover up the bad feeling of that with something like tobacco uh that addiction itself is the magnet being split and you've created a, a little compartment of your own biofield a little bubble in your biofield that is now because it's part of your energy that is a conscious living force it now has a separate existence you've separated it and it's become demonic the word demon means like 
two. It's a, it has to do with a division, an artificial mm. splitting. Mm. And, and that's what these things are in our field that they come in as like people that get real fractured in this way is also how MK Ultra mind control works is to do this on purpose to a, a being. They experience so many voices that they start to think that, you know, they have the schizophrenic thing going on. But it's actually, if you ask me, and there could be exceptions to this, I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, there could be exceptions of, I mean, I know from personal experience that there are also these type of energy tangles that aren't even in your field when you encounter them. They're somewhere out in the larger field doing their thing. I call those AIs. But I call the ones inside of us AIs too, because it's an artificial yeah. split. It's an artificial intelligence. It's the same exact way that it works in a computer system, which is a, a closed loop circuitry that you're putting electricity into, which is there's only really one type of energy in the universe from what I can tell, which is that electricity. You put that in a closed loop circuitry and it can think and it can follow the commands and it's a genie in a bottle and that's a demon. <laughs> Well, let's not even get hung up on that making it evil. I wouldn't say necessarily it would. We can create thought forms to do all kinds of things if they're aligned with and they're coherent and life affirming, then fine. That's what ancestors are that people, I just had someone on talking about connecting with native ancestors. And to me, that's um, the same type of thing, but with a coherent spin. It's like a little energy bubble that spun off from someone else's field that gave birth to it in, in some moment of, of intention or even trauma, but it was a, it was coherent energy. And so now it like tries to interact with someone that has a similar frequency that is coherent with it. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think like the religions have really given us, <laughs> man. So I had somebody on, I had somebody that was like a supporter of my show one time that was paying extra on Patreon it was really cool. They all of a sudden, Somebody on Facebook went off about how my logo proved that I was Luciferian and bad. And, Me too. Uh, <laughs> and then this person who was my supporter was so was so in belief about what the other person had to say that they like pulled their support from me and everything. And we had been friends up to that point and now we don't talk. I'm just like, this is really weird. And uh, it's all because like this ar this archetype of Lucifer or the eye that's in my logo, the eye that's inside of a sun, is interpreted to mean like evil or Illuminati or bad. But, is it there uh, on your shirt? You can show us? Yeah, hey, there it is on my shirt. <laughs> I just made this design. It's like, okay, it's a sigil. It contains my intentions for the show, but they're good intentions. Mm -hmm. Just because it's a one eye symbol doesn't mean I'm like part of the evil or part of a Luciferian cult. In fact, mm -hmm. if you go, if we dig into the Lucifer archetype, we find out it wasn't always this archon concept. It's been corrupted long ago by Rome on purpose because what it was was Venus, which was the goddess of love, which is actually a super helpful archetype and important to all of existence because love is the is the animating force. Mm. The fact that it's like she's the goddess that is uh, Isis gives birth to things symbolically. All that that mother energy is where the origin origin is everything mm -hmm. comes out of a portal from a mother womb so to demonize that and make that evil or go even further back it's the same archetype as prometheus who uh, that has been dealer. interpreted very different in very difficult ways for us too and so like look, that's mercury right mercury hermes uh, i think prometheus i think in that version it is yeah but it's a similar idea it's a light bearer or light bringer giving the fire to man uh, I mean, if God didn't want us to have the fire, so to speak, metaphorically of uh, awareness or like this knowledge of right and wrong, why would that have happened then? <laughs> like, why would we be here doing this? I, mm -hmm. I don't understand how you could go against the will of creation, of, For sure. of creation itself. Uh, For sure. It destroys you instantly if you do. That like the wrath of God is nature's own way or is like the way that your own incorrect dissonant behavior destroys you automatically. No there need for a lightning bolt from the sky. It's automatic. That's the only wrath of God that there is. And that should be the one thing that teaches you as to whether or not a behavior is a uh, right, right action is like, is it corrupting you or the environment around you or not? But I'm nice. kind of going in a, a ramble here, but <laughs> I just wanted to, 
uh, yeah, I just wanted to jump in with my logo, which you can barely see up, up in the corner there, but uh, it's a trident. And uh, so I remember the day I was on on Twitter and, and someone said, oh my God, I just went to your website. It turns out you're a Satanist and I have to demonize you and uh, unfollow you and tell everybody not to follow you. Was, and I was very well aware when I chose the, the trident of uh, the variety of meanings that it can have. And, uh, and, and, but then you actively, and I'm sure you're aware of the all seeing eye, but I decided to actively put energy into this symbol that wasn't uh, dissonant, that wasn't sucking the life out, but that was life giving, because that's, that's what I stand for personally. And uh, so sometimes you take that on in a, in a really deliberate way. Same thing with the, the you know, I had the, the mermaid was, was up in my brand. You can see there's still the remnants of it in the, in the, the water element and the trident maybe related to Poseidon and stuff. And, uh, and there's all kinds of nasty things like mermaids are, are man eaters and uh, pretty de demonic, especially the way Hollywood has, has treated them but it's not the only side and I connected with a totally different side of them and so I became the messenger, maybe a, a Hermes figure or the Prometheus stealing some fire <laughs> and bringing it to the people. But uh, you know, we have a lot of choice in the matter. All of this, all of this is organic material that we're, that we're dealing with. And uh, some people would say some sigils are too far gone. Like if you tried to take the ex the up the upside down pentagram and uh, and and reclaim that, and and put different energy into, it, you might have a, just a really you know too strong a battle on your hands and waste all your time fighting with that and with people. I don't people. recommend taking that one on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, the ocean is where this is what I'm talking about. Mother or energy being the origin. If you go in the ocean. If mm -hmm. you find the right place, every shape of everything we ever invented or imagined is already there. Mm -hmm. Every single type of geometry, every type of architecture, every type of biological capability, it's all in there. So it's it's definitely the origin. That's why all the old gods of uh, ancient civilizations tended to come out of the sea and be like fishmen and stuff, because I think that's symbolic of pointing out that that type, that part of the architect archetypes or the frequency spectrum of reality is is like the uh foundation origin point in a, in a sense like the where the womb that everything's birthed out of is the ocean and then even we're not out of the water right now we're just in a different density of water we're still underwater yeah there you go yeah you could say we're still we're still being born to the next level so we're still swimming in the in the womb here Exactly. Rex loves more mermaids. That's awesome. <laughs> and uh, what was I going to just ask you about? Now I got uh, I got mermaids on the brain. But um, well, I'll say something about the all seeing yeah. eye or whatever. OK, sure. If, if this is the all seeing eye to somebody, that's you know, that's fine. That's your thing. But it could also be your aperture, like your third eye aperture, uh, even the concept of the all seeing eye. What if that concept to you could mean more like what it originally meant, which is that the spirit of creation literally sees through every eye of every point of energy in the entire creation. Like spirit, one way of considering spirit is that it has to be not only the thing that animates all existence in this moment, but for it to actually properly animate all the existence in this moment, it has to have a total record of everything that ever happened first up to that point to configure things that way which as soon as you start to grapple with that concept, you're like, wow, even being here sitting in this chair talking to you is beyond all miracles, <laughs> mathematically impossible. So uh, <laughs> totally. I, I think that this symbol, any, a one eye, your eye single, Christians that get upset about this symbol with me, I like to just be like, look, your, I, I say your Bible. I love the Bible too. I've, I've gotten so much out of it, especially in the last year. Mm. There's a specifically, Verses that talk about you got to make the eye single. Let you, thine eye be single. Yeah, I mean mm. this is a not an evil or no, archetype. If if that if thine eye be single, and then I'm not going to remember that. I'll have to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's about getting it's about getting that magnet put back together instead of being split in the uh, the fake division where now you're in the four instead of in the wholeness. Because really, mm. as soon as you split into two, you're immediately four, not just two, because those two have the two poles. So 
magnets teach us a lot. This is something that came to my awareness recently. And one of the greatest ways of describing how division works on our, our internal level. That's beautiful. Um, while I think of it, since it's coming up right now, magnets reminds me of the masculine feminine archetype. And uh, one of the things that inspired me to do this podcast in the first place was the, you know, growing up a feminist and being on my pedestal and always uh, very carefully in a sophisticated way, hating men, pretending I wasn't. And, uh, and then finally waking up and seeing how completely agendized that whole thing. And when you talk about the, the magnetism between men and women and the masculine and the feminine archetypes and how all of this has been rigged and weaponized against us, what's your take on those? If you, I, I've taken to calling them archetype, not, not archetypes, because they don't even, to, in, in my uh, observation, they don't exist one the other it's like two poles of a magnet you don't have a magnet anymore if you only have one pole yeah i think there's this is a tricky concept because it gets in the like dark occult they're really into this idea of taking the two pillars and making them into one and that could be a way of interpreting making the eye single but what that is is an externalized attempt to do this uh reunific reunifying of something that's broke inside you and the only thing that we really need to build a bridge between for all of the other divisions in our life to start to heal is the corpus calisium, or however you say this word. It's the, the little bridge that's between your right and left brain where they communicate through. Strengthen that because a lot, a lot of the like judgment thinking types that we are trained to do all the time, I'm better than them, they're better than me, projecting your shadow onto the other or the less well-known one projecting your virtue on other people going back to putting them on a pedestal someone being on the stage they're the special one wow i could never do that one of the main reasons i started my show was because as soon as i started teaching myself programs like adobe illustrator and photoshop i went oh my god anybody could learn to do anything if they just took the time there's no such thing as talent there's aptitude we, are, we have aptitude and that's to do with what we care about that goes back to the venus thing it's that's why it's the force of animating everything because if you don't care about something, go ahead and try to do it. <laughs> you probably won't even start. And the more you care about it, the better job you'll do. So cultivating care is important. And that's what, as far as the agenda and the external goes, it's about getting people not to care. It's about ramping up the intensity of, the, of how shocking things can be that are presented to a being with not letting them get out of apathy. And uh, so that's the, what the boiling the frog thing is all about. And I uh, look, there's a lot of stuff out there that's wrong that we need to have discernment about, but discernment and judgment, we need to leave the judging to God, so to speak. Mm -hmm. We can have discernment, Amen. but like even someone with what appears to be the most evil blackest heart in this dimension, it, deep in that magnet, there's the other side of the polarity. And this is one of the reasons I, I'm ultimately hopeful. I look at all kinds of conspiracy stuff, but it's not to like be scary. It is to let us all see the things in the external that we're hooked into, that if we change, that that thing might change. And it's a lot of pieces to that puzzle. <laughs> it's a lot of pieces to that puzzle. Um, man, I had a good metaphor that just reminded itself to me and I lost it, but let's see if it comes back to me in a second. I'll ask, please come back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I distracted you. I just wanted to put up the, uh, it's Matthew six twenty two. the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thine, thy whole body shall be full of light. That could not be more exactly right. Like, <laughs> not what we're talking about, right? Nailed so, it. The light of the body. Because those p parts of our field where trauma is holding on and making those little bubbles, those are like little, actually, there's curly in photography and stuff where Ener hardcore energy vampires are people that practice energy vampirism on purpose. This is a whole nother subject. They, uh, they have holes in their aura. It's all pockmarked with black spots. And that's what it's talking about. If, if uh, you're preying on others, that actually hurts. It might feel like you're getting a boost off of taking advantage of somebody, but it actually is messing up your field and making more of these little demons that need to feed off of uh, other people's field. The reason why a, a demonic entity has to feed on a light entity. The reason why hardcore narcissists are drawn to 
um, vulnerable empaths is because the, the demonic thing is in a circuitry, a closed loop system. Like if you unplug your computer out of the wall, bye bye AI. Yeah. yeah. So it needs, we have a different system setup going on. We actually, our, our bones make light. Your bones are crystal that yeah. physioelectrically create light. Just every part of you is light and conductive and electric, right? So I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, that's our divine spark that's in us. That body is the spark. The divine spark is the seed and it becomes the tree. And so when the tree is there, where's the seed that made it? You can't find that seed. It's the whole thing. That's what your divine spark is. You can't go looking for it. You, your body's actually the thing like this is very lost in so many spiritual traditions. One of the big problems I have with all the offshoots of Gnosticism and uh, even materialism, modern ideas like simulation theory, anything that degrades the body or nature and says that like, this is fake, this is a prison, this is a trap. Well, yeah, you're making it one just by believing that about yourself. And so mm -hmm. <laughs> I love this first because it's totally right on the money. Our, our bodies are the light. And if we fill ourselves with that light, that's what the only, the barriers that create those little bubbles of sort of demonic consciousness, they can't exist in the light. It's mm -hmm. little pockets where the light isn't reaching that creates the, this bubble, if you will, if your whole body's full of light, it all just gets reintegrated into your wholeness. And yeah. And then all you've got left is you and your guardian angels, which are the archetypes in their positive manifestation showing up right on time to give you the message you need or the opportunity you need. And building up your charge is what gives you the ability to see those opportunities in the external too. You're too busy worrying about how bad you feel and pretending like you don't to even notice all the amazing potentials of just any moment of any given day that you could take advantage of. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's awesome. Um... <laughs> yep. My, my, I was going to go back to something and I just, my mind got blown by that yeah, uh, truth bomb you just dropped there. Good, it's gone. So I lost <laughs> they all lose yeah. things in these first Oh, days. yes. Yes. Um, just about the body. So having spent a number of years studying Eastern philosophy and going to India and working with that guru and stuff, they, it wasn't quite meat suit, but it was like, oh, that, that body's going to slough off. And, uh, and really there's everything from here down was considered low class. And it's exactly what you said. It's not. It's not that it uh, it went away. It just became intensely suppressed. It became uh, relegated into the unconscious, and and as a result, what is it? Was what does anything do from the unconscious? It acts out, trying to capture attention, right? Because it, it, you're you're not giving it your attention. It has. Uh, become starved of your attention and and it's like a like a, a little kid who's starved of attention it's going to start to make trouble so that you pay attention to that and I came really a long way with this and I saw at some point very uh, firsthand in my own experience seeing what an incredible love affair there is between the body and the soul as if they're two separate entities that's language gets in our way there but it's a total love affair like this this body it's a miracle to be having this conversation to be in this flesh and in these bones like you said the bones themselves are these uh crystals that are conducting energy the same way that it's operating the computer that the it's, it's working in the body and so amen to that it's a, a lot of spiritualities slough the body off <laughs> and i totally agree with you and someone in the chat asked if i had thoughts on death that's always a sticky place to go because i'm not going to claim to know something about a place i haven't consciously been or have any like evidence of but I have had experiences that took me out of being in, even in my body, completely other places. Uh, psychedelic induced, yeah, but also sometimes on the natch, as you would say. <laughs> I mean, on I've even on the natch, <laughs> naturally. Natch. Okay, okay. Uh, the CHs don't come across very well sometimes on mic, but yeah, I, I, at least a few times in my life, I've experienced lifting out of my body before going to sleep and being in sort of like a light body, spirit body, able to fly around the room and go look at things up close. And other experiences like that tell me that there's definitely a 
sh like the idea of sheaths. I like that idea. It's cool with me that there's sort of a, your electrical energy is in a vessel, if you will. And then if that energy pops back out of the vessel because the, you can't hold it anymore, I don't know what could happen. Maybe it depends on your level of coherence. Maybe that's the idea of sort of whether or not you're saved or redeemed, if you will. Maybe if you have a very dissonant energy and you get swallowed back up into the field of eternal oneness of all the other electrical energy in the soup of creation, if it's like dissonant, well, dissonant frequencies, it, they are actually automatically entrained and upgraded to resonate with something that's coherent if the coherent energy is there. So if your dissonant energy gets spilled out into the whole field and the field is perfect creation in oneness and unity, you probably maybe, I don't say that I know, but maybe at that point that that uh, configuration of energy that was your personal work of art that you've been doing this lifetime, maybe it gets sort of disintegrated. You're not gone at that point, what you were, but maybe you just get absorbed and cycled back into the well of souls to have your entire amnesia thing done to you because maybe that's where the amnesia between lifetimes comes from because people are not coming out of the vessel in coherence. I don't know. But if you were in coherence and maybe then that's like sort of, an, that's the Merkaba people talk about maybe that's allowing you to lift up out of the body and stay you. And then maybe you don't even have to go back into a new vessel or when you do, you can go in with more of what you learned from last time. Uh, I don't know. It's a really interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And we don't, get to unravel the mystery as far as I can tell. <laughs> no matter how deep you go, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know, the deeper the mystery actually is. So it's a beautiful thing. Someone did ask about death. So if you I don't know if you have anything more you'd like to say about that. But uh, what do you have? Do you have beliefs around death? Do you hold any kind of uh, framework around that? Uh, oh, uh, by the I way, by the way, like... I just want, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but just uh, what you were saying also about being absorbed into the all, I was just reminded of one more when uh, Bible verse, I don't know the verse itself, but Jesus basically said, come as you are, right? And I found useful, I found this useful for the times when I've got into low energy and I think, well, I can't come to God with this. And it's like, no, no, I can come to God as I am. And the immediate... Uh, experience is exactly what you said. It's being it's being lifted up. It's being transformed right there in that moment, bringing the the dissonance to God. That's that's the whole magic, as far as I'm concerned. All right, ah, your turn. great because it's like judgment that keeps you from thinking it's okay to go to God because you're like not worthy at this moment. But you exactly. know, there's a teacher that I really like, Seven Bomar from Secret Energy. He he does awesome stuff. Uh, now, not saying that he's God, but like he has such a positive, high vibing, if you will, to to use that poor description, mm -hmm. high energy though. Like he's got really great on point messages that always just like, even if I don't even fully get what he meant on a left brain level, whenever I listen to him, usually I feel something life affirming about it. I feel ju juiced up, powered up. And when I'm in a not so great energy state, low, energy, dissonant energy, I won't even turn that guy on. And it's funny mm -hmm. because a few times that I do go and turn him on after, after a point where I'm feeling low, I feel that life affirming thing. And I'm like, oh, that's why I listen to this guy because he's something about it is coherent because I feel energy. I feel better, cleaner energy than I felt before when I listened to him. So there's a lot of people that do that for me too. So that's a good, that's the ring of truth, man. If even if you listen to a teacher and you don't even get half of what they said, if you feel like jazzed up, like your cells are tingling after you listen to it, or that all of a sudden you're having all kinds of ideas of something you want to go and do now that would be that would be exciting to you, that's probably a good teacher. That's probably something worth listening to. Maybe even worth trying to figure out what they meant from a left brain level too. But <laughs> <laughs> And later yeah. you might realize, oh, I kind of got caught up in something a little culty. Maybe this isn't my thing anymore. But at the point mm -hmm. where you were getting life affirming energy out of it, it was your thing. It's okay that you were in it. And then discernment might come later as your aperture opens further and you see more of what's behind the curtain, maybe. And that happens with 
all ki- there's all kinds of teachers where I walked away from them at a certain point because mm-hmm. I got behind the curtain and I went, okay, well, all the things that I learned from them that helped me, I've integrated that. Don't need to stay in a loop on the things that they're stuck on that they are bringing to the table perpetually, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, absolutely. Yeah, I like uh I like what you're saying about judgment. If we can zero in, I noticed that you have a uh, uh, inclination towards looking at the law and the contract in, in the Bible, and you have a different take on Adam and Eve, if we can jump over there and maybe weave that back to the masculine feminine as well. So what do you have to say? And, and are you a fan of Cal Washington, by the way? I know I've heard him on shows, but I don't okay. think I've dug into his okay. stuff. Okay, yeah. So you guys would have different things to say about Adam and Eve, but I would I would love to hear and how this relates back to the archons. I just heard you talk about how, you know, there was two creations of of man and then of Adam and Eve. Yeah, uh, that's the really far out thing about the Genesis story that I didn't even know until I was looking into Clint and his uh, work that is really rooted in, in biblical stuff, which is so helpful because he he figured out that the entire legal system is actually built on the foundation of the King James Bible. So when we say read the King James Bible, it's not because it's the best translation or the most understandable translation. It's because it's what the law is actually based on. And exactly. The 1611, I have my copy about to, to land any second. And let's be real. The yeah. guy that uh, commissioned that thing also was responsible for a bunch of witch burnings and horrible, horrible stuff. He wrote the book on demonology. So of course he would understand that this thing he's publishing to become the foundation of the common law is gotta have the warning about demonology, which is like you give something a name and you can control it. And that's what mm-hmm. to, that's what the name thing's about. And so to get back to Genesis, Jehovah creates man. Of course, in this King James Bible, they take the word Jehovah and most of the time they change it to Lord or God. Lord is actually the same word as Baal. Baal means Lord, right. B-A-A-L. So whenever, whenever you see Lord in the Bible, you might be talking about, or Elohim as well, you might be talking about these archons or magistrates. The word God in Webster's 1828, one of the definitions is a prince, ruler, or magistrate. So let's get that straight, that the Bible is definitely confused, confused in a lot of its terms on purpose so that you don't know left from right, God from man, and this Mm -hmm. creation story of man, Jehovah being the eternal animating spirit of existence, of course, does create man because evidently we're here. And man as a word includes female men and male men. We're all men, actually, and that's okay. It doesn't make you less if you're a female to say that I'm I'm of men or I'm a man. It's just mm-hmm. like a horse is a horse, even if it's a, a mare or a stallion, it's mm-hmm. still a horse. Mm-hmm. And even it's crazy, but woman is a legal status, it has entirely different rights in the legal code. So if we want equality, maybe we shouldn't have entirely different legal statuses based on our gender <laughs> and all the different pronouns we could come up with for a gender. Since pronouns aren't even what we are, to identify with them is a problem. And yeah, that which can be named can be controlled. So Mm. after Jehovah creates man, the entire race of man, as part of the creation of nature itself, later on we get the Elohim, which is a plural, creating Adam. And Adam is also meant to refer to a group or all mankind. But now it's got a specific name. You've divided it into Adam and Eve, also with a name. You've done this breaking of the magnet in half, if you will. Mm. And even in older mythology, Zeus did this to the first men. He, they seemed too happy because they had their, they had their male spirit and their female spirit inhabiting one body. And uh, everyone was a hermaphrodite, I believe in the old Greek mythology. Zeus was like, these uh, humans are too happy. So I'm gonna throw a lightning bolt and split them in half. And yeah, it's like we'll get hung up on the word Jehovah because Jehovah and Zeus have etymological connections all day. And that's, I get that. There's been a lot of phonetic, on purpose confusion from individuals that want to keep us from certain names. What's powerful about the name Jehovah is not as a noun, is just as the realization that God as a concept is a verb and a process of all eternity 
in an existence perpetually. And the Elohim thing, that's a group of magistrates, in my opinion. It's not like the Anunnaki. It's not people from space. All of that is, in my opinion, distraction from the fact that when the magistrates gave a legal status and title to their serfs in the, the very first instance of feudalism that ever cropped up, that's when control happened. That's mm -hmm. when the fall of man happens. And that's when you start counting the generations of man from there, because this is like a rancher uh, keeping track of its livestock, metaphorically yeah. speaking. That's how I kind of see it. That's the two creation stories. There's, you know, can I ask you a question? Do a much better job explaining the nuances of that. I'm still like a baby in terms of getting into the Bible as a place to decode information. For sure. Uh, so I just want to ask a, a question because if you talk to Cal Washington, he would he would quote the Adam and Eve creation story as proof that we actually have uh, sovereignty. That although he wouldn't use the word sovereign because that means to rule over, but we, we you know we we have our freedom, and that um, you know God at that time of of the creation of Adam and Eve gave dominion over everything over the earth, the land, the waters, the creatures that crawl, the creatures that fly, and the um, the angels, the witnesses, right? So do you think that this is actually a flip? And this is this is the, the dominion of the uh, what we see to be the psychopaths who run the world today? Yeah, I, I do, just because of what the word dominion means. Uh, there's uh, it's interesting you said angels because the word dominion is actually one of the definitions is uh, an order of angels, the way mm. that you call like a bunch of birds, a flock, a dominion of angels. Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> kind of interesting. And yes. so angels or demons, arch archons or uh, archons or guardian angels, I guess, guardians, fairies or aliens there's a bunch of different you know nature spirits or space beings there's a bunch of ways that the same type of experience of us encountering intelligence in the field that is not in the same type of vessel that we are uh in the positive and negatives of that i think that's where the original spiritual concept of angels is coming from that there would of course that there would have to be life affirming intelligence in that field too and i think in this realm we see both forces constantly playing out like you got to have the decay to make way for the new life to come in but then you also have to have some sort of witness giving and granting the essence of attention energy which is the what spiritual current really is is all based on attention and awareness i think you got to have angels to have a flower grow and bloom Mm. That's where there's the old idea that there's like an angel there cheering it on. I do think so, but it, it's like it's personal guardian spirit or the consciousness that is in that energy circuitry of that flower. So we don't even have to look at the angel as separate from the flower. It's the same type of I am that we are. Now, with giving dominion to Adam and Eve, well, that is sovereign or supreme authority, the power of governing and controlling. And Daniel 4.3 says, the dominion of the Most High is an everlasting dominion. So if the Most High has an everlasting dominion, then uh, you and me don't have dominion over anything, in my opinion. I don't think we're meant to look at, I think that is a, a trick, like a bait and switch to say that if you can have dominion over nature, now you're taking source, which is nature, and you're dividing some part of it out and taking it as your own possession and calling it a resource. And all you did was change the name. You put re in front of it, Ray. And now all of a sudden that magical title means that it is okay to rape and pillage that resource out of the creation, even if it's corrupting the creation to do that. I'm not saying we don't have the right to use what we find in nature in, a, in any way, shape or form. I'm not saying everything artificial is evil. But everything evil is artificial. So there's mm -hmm. that's important. Mm, nice. Nice. I <laughs> like that. 
I like that. I can still I can still work the mythology in my head. Like this is my famous thing again. I can take anything, even if it's backwards and upside down. I can still make it uh, make it coherent in my own system. And to me, the the Adam and Eve story. I, I love what you're saying, actually. And and I'm always open to having my mind completely blown and the story. You know, go back to zero and start over. Um, but to me, the the demonstration that people show of of dominating the earth is not a sign of dominion, it's a sign of lacking dominion, right? You don't need to dominate something that you already dominate. If you already have all the land and the waters and the, you don't need to go and conquer them and kill the people on that land and, uh, you know, decimate populations of animals to extinction. You're, you already own, you're, you're just, you have the power and you just have it. It's perfect. The animal practically comes up and says, oh, it's my turn. I'll be the sacrifice for, for the food this month. Or, you know, like you just drop a watermelon seed on the ground and poof, you got this big patch of uh, watermelons in 90 days or however long it takes, you know, so we have all the power. I feel, I feel like we have it right inside, the, even though we've been split up into these, into these magnets, each, each one, as you said at the beginning, is still an exact replica of, of its creator. Yeah, of and the its source. universe itself. Like the thing, there's two meanings of being created in the image of God. You could be created in the image of a lowercase God magistrate, which means that you're a two-dimensional character on paper, a cartoon. And there's a lot to oh man, yeah. There's a lot to the cartoon metaphor because everything that happens in the digital artificial realm for your personhood is time stamped with a certain like your bank statement would be useless if you didn't have all the times that the transactions occurred or it'd be mm -hmm. less useful, right? Mm -hmm. And so all these different footprints that we have online create like a flip book of cartoon images that when played in order, give an animation or a false life, artificial life to this cartoon character that is our corporate personhood owned and created by the state, right? But then there's also the fact that every real temple, every real cathedral, going back to ancient Egypt or Kemet and beyond, they would build these with symbolism that meant was meant to represent the human body, because it all comes back to the body. The body is in the image of the cosmos. We in our bodies are like fractally the way that the cells in our body are, you could say. And I think the bottom is the top. I think it's this weird Mobius loop. I, it's all one thing. There isn't hires and lowers. When you really get down to it or get up to it but it's just about perspective so relative to where you are now something might seem higher in that it's big and it's up there but well, you know to go back to this death question this isn't something i know for sure but i think what it is is a, we're in a womb right now and a matrix is a womb actually the word matrix means womb mm -hmm. it's one of the death matter mm -hmm. yeah, yeah so mm -hmm. i see it like well where were you before you were born you had an entire nine months of existence inside of a womb that was completely separate from language. There was, I mean, not completely. You're hearing things from outside, voices from the, around your mother. Who knows how the baby's processing that? But like, why would we think that those nine months for the baby felt like anything short of a whole lifetime? When I've had uh, consciousness expansion experiences where it was like weeks at a time. And then I come back and I was gone five minutes, you know, like time, time is a spiritual, the real time is spiritual movement or spiritual growth mm. or spiritual evolution. The Kronos time that. is the pattern looping that we're in rat race week after week. The AI the week. closed. Yeah. Closed loop. Yeah. But what you find whenever you get into expansion, like, out of the loop of time and just like in the moment doing what's right in that moment is that the way that you perceive and feel time passing is going to be totally different because your memory is going to be totally different and memory is the only thing that even gives you that expansion if <laughs> if you forgot who i was right now would you be able to continue this conversation no like <laughs> you're could happen you got a family member what's that mean? Because like you care so much about them if they're just deleted out of your memory, gone. That's why I think it's so important, this idea of staying coherent 
going through this portal that we call death that is probably just hopping out of another womb somewhere is that uh do we want all this to go completely poof and be meaningless at some point i i don't know i don't want to scare anybody maybe that's the way it really has to be but i don't see why in the infinity that we're a part of we couldn't change our own nature so that the nature of our experience i mean you can't change your own nature in a sense of like going outside of nature you can't become supernatural but another way of understanding nature is it's what you're becoming in this moment human nature is what we are becoming in this moment it's the i am part of ourselves so mm-hmm. i don't see why we couldn't maybe hop out of the next matrix into where we're going with a little bit more of of where we came from i think that that's like that would be like a real hero thing to do because if you kept your awareness of all the people that you love and take them with you to the next space maybe then maybe part of their what they are archetypally in your personal reality like gets to remember something too maybe you're like maybe it's saving everybody in a way <laughs> i mean that's just one way to look at it i wouldn't be scared of forgetting everything on death either but if there's a way out of that particular crossing of the rivers sticks I'm, i'm cool with i'm cool with finding it <laughs> if it presents itself but i do think coherence could be the answer and that's maybe rambly a little bit but here we go <laughs> <laughs> no it's Before good and it, mm-hmm. and it reminds me of uh, i lost my parents a, a few years back and t- both of them died really jacked up on on opiates and that is the norm if you die in a hospital if you don't have a sudden death or you don't make a very conscious choice not to die that way that's more or less what happens to people i've at a time been there i wasn't uh, in that moment dying but i saw how incredibly incoherent it was and how sad and i couldn't i couldn't make another choice i couldn't tell my my mom like don't take those drugs absolutely couldn't if she wants them Uh, I even hold out that I might want them and, uh, you know, we don't know, we don't know what we're going to be faced with on, on our, on our death. I've, I had an, uh, my own experience of that. I know, I know that it's not the thing that I thought it was. I know that my fear of dying is actually uh, the thing that I mistake for dying, but is not dying. That fear of dying is, is an entirely different kind of a, an incoherence that once unsuppressed turns into life energy turns into to not only uh just becomes it doesn't just become benign it becomes it becomes life force it's locked up it's it's electromagnetic force that stuff that's the transmuting for sure yeah that's your fuel and have you ever heard of the term terminal lucidity no but i like it (laughs) (laughs) what the great awakening actually is for humanity hopefully not but terminal lucidity is when somebody who's been like maybe they've through the ringer and they are on all those pills and they're on their deathbed and they've been in hospice for months and any day now they're gonna die and all of a sudden for like 24 or 48 hours they're clear again clear as a bell they can get up and walk around they can have the final conversations that they need to have with their loved ones mm-hmm. and uh then they just kind of like get on the dream train and pass out and they're gone but where does this terminal lucidity come from if the body is so beyond wrecked that it's not got the coherence for that and so maybe because there's this thing called terminal lucidity maybe once the body is completely no longer a, a proper vessel for your life force energy maybe getting out of the shell is going to make the lucidity or the, the coherence or clarity come back and I mean, maybe there's nothing to worry about in terms of losing yourself on death. Uh, it could, That's could very beautiful. well be. That's maybe, beautiful. Maybe the only losing yourself on death is when you're so afraid of who you are that even when you jump out of the shell that you reject the awareness of yourself and maybe like self-annihilate, if you will, spiritual suicide. I won't rule that out as possible. I think that could be maybe even like a defense mechanism for the universal organism against particularly dissonant energy structures but yeah i mean terminal lucidity happens it's a real thing mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. hopefully humanity is not in a terminal lucidity right now with all the waking up that's going on <laughs> maybe it's but even if it was i don't think it's too late for us we're you know we're not 
something that can just be wiped out of existence in the same way as a single individual ego personality can. Uh, I don't. I mean, we were we're part of the capital T truth. There's, there's a reason why we are in existence. Why we have this animating life force. Why we have the spiritual discernment. Why we're not just creatures of pure instinct. Why we have the ability to care so much that we actually bring new, like uh, the way that a triad does in the musical chord, you and me have this conversation, some third force comes through and brings out ideas and light that neither of us even knew that we were carrying. Like a lot of the conversation today is me learning what I think, not even something I, this is not prepared at all, you know? I hear you. I hear you. It's amazing. In in India, they called it satsang, like the, the keeping the company of of truth itself, of that existence, right? That we keep shining the mirror back, in, in not not just on you or on me, but on truth itself. And that's how the, you know energy rises in coherence as we do this. I love the terminal lucidity thing. I had the exact moment with my mom where we thought. She was gone from consciousness. She was gone from expression. She couldn't talk anymore. She couldn't. She couldn't be coherent. Just to use that that word, coherent, if I can still say it. And then all of a sudden, I'm there in the middle of the night with her, and and she comes to and she starts singing a song. Like this is a woman who couldn't talk, and you know wasn't with it. And we thought her last moments were any second. And then all of a sudden, she's singing a song, and we're having a chat, and we're talking. And I started singing with her. Uh, do my ears hang low do they wobble to and fro like why did she pick that one i don't know a real childhood kind of thing moment for me and it was utter lucidity but she wasn't any less jacked up on the opiates there wasn't right so there was something that bust through in that moment that was maybe present the whole time so it's actually very beautiful to hold open that it's not you know all of our people that are dying in that state it's not ruining their chances it's not like a plot by the deep state to to ruin their chance to to uh transcend or whatever but actually i like your i like your um your analogy so much better because it's it's we're not in chronos that is an artificial thing the magistrate gave us here's your time and then you're going to meet this time and the time's up and and that's not the universe that i'm in my universe is continuous it's a spiral. There's no, there's no end to to how coherent energy can become. You're not going to look back and, at least as far as I can tell, you're not going to look back and go, "Whew, that's done." <laughs> we're that's finished. why it's about the journey, not the destination. Because Amen. The, what we're on right now is an infinite stair, infinite game of shoots and ladders. Like you're going to get on the shoot, and you can drop as far as you want to drop, or you can keep climbing. What's interesting is when people hit what they perceive as rock bottom, all of a sudden they feel like they're on top again. <laughs> so even that, even the path of Darth Vader is going to take you to truth. You either find out who you are by embodying it and feeling the resonance of it and recognizing it for what it is, or you find out who you are by being who you're not so much that you can't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. And we all do a little of both in our life journey, a lot of both really. Exactly. It reminds me of the trickster archetype who sometimes teaches how not to be. Here, look at me and all the trouble I get in. You want to be like that too? <laughs> yeah, exactly like you said earlier, the archetypes that come back and, and bite us are actually just trying to show us what needs our attention, which is our witness, which is like definitely our sacred gift is that we have witness that we can share. I mean, there's we have so much catching up to do with our understanding of the ego self and the ego personality and witness. We have many different teachers out there that do preach the repression or even the killing of the ego. And uh, first of all, it's not even possible. And second of all, without like just leaving this body. And then second of all, it doesn't feel life affirming to me. And I'm not saying that there's no such thing as an unhealthy ego definitely heal the ego for sure but love the one that you are as be as part of the whole one you know like that's so it's it's okay to be proud of things that you do that are good it's okay to feel good about yourself all these things are like taught that somehow pride comes before the fall and all that and 
of course pride comes before a fall because if you're going to fall you had to have felt good first so it's like how do we get proud of ourselves and then not fall <laughs> why well, have something jump in to here. be proud of actually worth being proud of I'd love to jump in here. There's a, a big subject. I teach an entire module in my training coaching on pride itself. And what I just heard possibly is that this, the Bible has been switched out. The word is not pride before the fall, or, or actually, no, I have to take that back. So it is pride cometh before the fall. I actually 100% agree with that. What it is when you feel good about yourself and you can say like, hey, I did this. I wrote a book called Journey, which I did, by the way. <laughs> and uh, I want to send you a copy. And uh, that's yeah. not, that's not, I mean, it can be pride. It can be me wanting to feel superior and I have a book and you don't or whatever. I don't even know if I, I forgot to ask you if you had a book. Uh, but the, the real thing about feeling good about yourself, that's courage. It takes courage to feel good about yourself, especially in a world that is programming us to hate ourselves. So that's not pride, but pride, the way that I've taken it from the work of Lester Levinson and David Hawkins, actually not, so, not even much, as much David, but, but Lester Levinson, and it's, it's the jealousy, the judgment, right, that, that, that um, acting as the, the judging God that you talked about earlier, put, seating yourself in that position, it's not discernment, it's actual judgment, uh, jealousy, superiority and inferiority when you feel inferior you're also in a, a kind of uh, reverse pride but it's still pride and and the nature of pride is to separate so that i know i'm i, I made it, maybe i don't know who i am or what i am but i know i'm definitely not you that's what pride does and that's what cometh before the fall that's my take on it anyway but i know what you're talking about the feeling good about, your, about yourself i'm all for it <laughs> yeah and you can do that without creating this superiority complex or anything like the, the real people that have like the healthy pride or the healthy ego everything that they go around doing that they feel so good about that they did others that see it go i feel kind of like maybe i have permission to be cooler and I don't mean cool, like in a, exactly. a trendy, fashionable way. I mean, just like in a truly like to me, a cool person is somebody that it feels good to be around that mm. when that what the things that they do and the stories they tell me about their life make me go, oh, wow, I'd like to try that. I think I'm going to or or what have you. And I like what you said about courage, because uh, to go back to James True, I read some of his books recently and got picked up some really good stuff there and uh there's this amazing dichotomy he paints between courage and hope and that hope is actually the toxic thing that they gave us all the way since back in star wars episode four a new hope where hope is hope is the cue thing you know hope is wait and trust the plan and not necessarily act it takes courage to act and hope is like usually wait i'm not saying that there aren't things that are okay to hope for like I hope everything works out for everybody, <laughs> but that doesn't make me not act. We got to recognize where like, I hope this person I love changes or that I hope that the dynamic I'm in with, with this situation changes is actually you sort of failing to act. And if we do have enough pride in ourself, as in like, we care about our self so much that we want to make sure that the right thing happens for us and by us, then that's uh, also something that can give you that courage. Because I, I think that the greatest way to feel at peace with it, to trust God, in my opinion, to trust reality, <laughs> which is really important. Uh, even Jesus Christ, that, that name, there's some biblical scholars that say that it means Jehovah is salvation, which is literally saying reality is salvation or truth is salvation it makes perfect sense. Uh, if you can trust yourself that you intend to do the right thing in any situation and that you have the type of pride in yourself that says i'm going to i am that good of a person to do the the right thing as best i can as i see it following my conscience which is also the same thing as common sense uh then you can relax about whether or not things are going to be okay in your life because all you can know and trust that whatever comes up, a trustworthy person is going to be there because I'm there. And that's the good kind of pride. That's a healthy kind of pride. Not, not believing that you're incapable of making mistakes, but that 
when you recognize the mistake, you admit it and then, you know, make the alteration. It's a different kind of pride. It's not a stuck in your ways pride. It's a, I care what happens to me. I care mm -hmm. what happens to others because of me. Mm -hmm. And so I want to be, I want to set the intention to be the person I trust most in any room. And that's okay. <laughs> it's okay to have that level of trust in yourself, but uh, you should, you know, live up to that, I guess. So that's, we are all working on that. There's plenty of things I could do to be more trustworthy to myself. Like do I completely eliminate sugar from my diet, for example? Nah, <laughs> do I, I eat pretty clean, but there's still like things I let slide. Um, and I think also it's okay to have, to have those things to room for improvement because it is infinite stairs. As long as we're making some kind of pivot on a regular basis towards a higher level of coherence, things will continue to work themselves out and we'll continue to have more life affirming mojo. And, hmm. and if I keep building my mojo, I might write a book too, like you very well done that you did. You got a book done. I can't wait to crack in and that'll be a great way for me to mine some subjects for when we have you on interverse pretty soon. Yay. <laughs> so good. This has been amazing. And I have a feeling we're going to have to do this again if you're open to it, because uh, we just scratched the surface on all kinds of deep subjects there. But the time has uh, come to a close. Salted Cedar said this guy has some knowledge. Wow. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Interesting. That's a whole other can of worms. We won't go down that road this moment, but it's really good uh, to, to make a note for the future on, on that. Uh, what a pleasure, Chance, it's been to, to talk to you. It's always so beautiful to find souls that are interested in going deep like this and uh, have done so much work on themselves as you obviously have. So congratulations on that. It's it's not everybody that has the, the courage, I'll say, to, uh, to dive in and explore like this. <laughs> Thank you. Sometimes I think my rhetoric is way higher level than my actual behavior in my daily life. <laughs> There's so many ways that I could get healthier, get more coherent, working on it though. And you know, it can, we can feel like we are bad at, at the self work when we examine ourselves because the things that have always been kind of a sticking point often remain a sticking point. But uh, it's, I always feel like we're right at the beginning of something great. And this next mo this next thing is gonna be the yes. great thing. And then after that is gonna be just that feeling of anticipation is a really helpful way to build your personal charge or energy or power because the, the last thing I'll say is memory is formed better if you have anticipation, participation, and recollection. So you're bringing witness to something three times, magic number, Ooh. and that's going to solidify that in your field as an experience that you learned and grow from instead of that you sleepwalk your way through and never even record in your memory banks. That's beautiful. So many truth drops. I, I just honestly to have to go back. This would be a good one to to transcribe. I have a, a goal to do that eventually to transcribe the best of all the, the King Hero Journey podcasts. And this one would qualify for sure. So do visit Chance at um, innerversepodcast.com. <laughs> And uh, subscribe to your favorite place where you like to listen to podcasts and uh, get regular. I've just scratched the surface of, of your shows, but have thoroughly enjoyed everything that I've listened to so far. And uh, if you're um, anything else you want to share that you'd like people to take you up on or support Beth however you can out there <laughs> if you guys are listening, oh. haven't found a way to su show some support, please do. Uh, this work is more complicated than it looks to just get up here and talk and <laughs> so we, true. we all benefit from getting that energy circuitry linked together with one another Re reciprocity is one of the keys to to living it in truth and in nature it's a, a gift for gift type of energy system and if you guys can give some of your energy to beth it will only come back and reflect back towards you as you benefit off of the journey that she's on. So thank you for having me here, Beth. It's been a blast. I hope Aww. people do check out some episodes of my show. I don't talk this much in my show. Some do, some of them I do. Usually I let the guest have a lot of room to uh, talk and we have really great subjects on all kinds of diverse topics. If you go through the top of the list and you're like, eh, I know all this stuff. 
dig a little further down, there's really no, there's not necessarily any one thing it's about. We hopefully talk about many empowering things and there's something for everybody, I like to think. And you have one of the best uh, radio voices also. I really enjoy your voice. And that's a big thing because I, that's a place where you can measure coherence or not measure, that's a bad way to say it, but uh, sense coherence in, in somebody's voice. So anyway, that's a good one. You have a good one. <laughs> It's funny, I hated the sound of my voice when I started. And mm. actually, some of, my, some of the ways that I speak, my elocution, if you will, has improved from doing this. So that's kind of cool. I, I don't sound the way I did on old recordings yet, still today. And that's maybe part of my, uh, that's part of our development. Our voice gets stronger, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I've always mm -hmm. been a chatty guy, though, so it's not... Any surprise, I wound up in this line of work. It's a lot of fun for me. Nice, nice. I got my cat barfing in the background here. That's a good sound effect for the in the podcast. With. I recognize that sound anywhere. Uh, <laughs> you gotta yeah. yeah. Gandalf is the one that pukes all the time. <laughs> right, right. We will have a, a cat cast coming. I can't resist. I've got tons of content in my head. It's about cat abuse. It, most people won't talk about cat abuse because it's, it's uh, you know, there's a lot of shame around it. So we're, we're going to get into that. <laughs> Some little spoof I cannot resist doing. And uh, definitely go and visit inner, innerversepodcast.com and take chance up on uh, his, his podcast. And uh, no doubt you will see him here again because this was a really fun conversation. Thank you everyone for being here. If you'd like to find out more about what I do, I get a copy of my book, uh, which is called Journey, a, a map of archetypes to find lost purpose in a sea of meaninglessness. Uh, then you can visit my website, bethmartins.com, and um, you can also sign up to do a Merpreneur or a King Hero's Journey archetype quiz. I should have laid that on you, Chance, before we did it, but it's not too late. We can do it again, or do it now. Uh, there are uh, a number of things that you can tune into. There's a, a webinar on the Hero's Journey. There's a, a webinar on the Nature Child, if you're interested in that. Lots of things to uh, dive in with, and all of the past episodes of the King Hero's Journey as well. So God bless you all. Thank you so much for coming. I'm going to enjoy more of your comments later this evening when I chill out. And uh, I will see you again very soon. Might be a surprise. And that's all for now. <laughs> Bye, Chance. Thanks, everyone. Loved having the chat. I don't usually do live, so it's cool when I'm in one. Good times. Thanks, everybody. Much love. Much love to you.